things like this. But that's one of the things I forgot. Uh, hallelujah. I forgot during my message the other night, I was going to say two different things and I forgot both of them in the middle, in mid sentence. And I never finished either one of them. And if I started off by saying, and I wanted to say this, I said, I'm about to pick on Lily for a second. Uh, and I wasn't really going to pick on her, but what I was going to say is, I, mean, I was talking about opinions because while I was on vacation, the Lord started to reveal to me that everyone has opinions, right? Amen. All men have opinions. Women have opinions. And what the Lord started to show me is, is that sometimes our opinions are right and sometimes our opinions are wrong, but that the Holy Spirit's opinion is always right. Amen. And I had a certain opinion formulated in my mind, and I'm using this as an example about Lily. And then one day somebody was at the altar and she was praying with them. And the Lord spoke directly to my spirit. And he said, look at her, Terry, at the altar. Yep. She belongs to me. I've gifted her and I want to use her. And you know what the interesting thing is, is that one of the ways I've learned to hear the voice of God is that the voice of God sounds so different than my flesh. I would have never come up with that plan in a million years. And so that's why I was, if I'm going to be willing to humble myself, amen, to be able to hear the voice of God. And so another thing, though, about opinions is this, and this is the other thing I wanted to say, is that sometimes the opinions of the pastor or his understanding about the word of God may differ than your mindset about certain passages of scripture or certain concepts of scripture. And that happens sometimes, right? I mean, and sometimes people will get to the point where they don't want to be involved in a church if some of the pastors, and I understand that, and people have a right to be able to be led by the Lord, to go where it is. But this is something that the Lord spoke to me, and I've said it once before, and I, but I feel like sometimes we get distracted and we don't always hear what's being said, and I think this is important. The Lord spoke something to me one night in the midst of these last several months, and he said, imagine people standing before me ready to receive their reward. And they had certain opinions about certain things and come to find out their opinions were wrong. Their opinions were wrong. And because their opinions were wrong, they still made it in. But whenever we settle up at the judgment seat of Christ, I'm about to preach on that. It's coming. But when we settle up at the judgment seat of Christ, because you've got to understand something, there's two judgments. One's called the great white throne judgment. And if your name is not written in the Lamb's book of life, bad day, bad day. But if your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, you won't be at the Great White Throne Judgment, but you will stand at the Judgment Seat of Christ, also known as the Bema Seat. Uh, Dustin mentioned the word Bema one time. Also known as the Bema Seat of Christ. And there our works will be judged. Yes. And the Lord spoke that to me. And he said, imagine a man or woman standing in my presence thinking that they had mindsets right. And now it's time for us to tally up because I got the books. And we're going to work the books and we're going to see what's in there. But now imagine you, son. Imagine you as pastor of a church. And you thought you knew what you thought you knew, but you were wrong. And because your opinion was wrong, you affected my sheep. You <laughs> affected their mind. You affected their hearts. You affected their walk. And now all your life you were praying. Let me hear those words, Lord. Let me hear those words, well done, my good and faithful servant. But then you didn't get to hear it because you, oh, you made it in. But your opinion stood in the way of what my word said. You had fear of man. You had fear that people weren't going to like you. And you stuck to what you knew in your heart wasn't right. No. I'm not going to do that, church. I'm not going to do that. But it, that doesn't mean my opinions are right and other people's opinions are wrong. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is I'm going to let the Holy Spirit lead me and guide me. I'm going to keep crying out to the Lord and asking him to have his way. Amen? I just want to get that out there. That was what I was trying to say, and I forgot those two spots. Listen, I want to talk to you all a little bit tonight. We're going to go ahead and 
get rolling in this again. A quick review. I want to be careful that I don't overdo my review. We talked about this Wednesday night. I'm starting to realize now that this is going to turn into at least a three-part series. But where I started with this on Wednesday night has drastically changed. And it took place, let me give you some background information. It took place because Wednesday night when we were in here during worship and during the presentation of the, the bringing of the word, I felt a spirit of heaviness. I had a few people and some people that don't really compliment much. And that's good because sometimes people give too many compliments. But said, man, that's a good message. So I don't think that it's not that the word didn't go forth the way that it was supposed to, but I could feel a spirit of heaviness. Other people agreed that there, some people, I called one person up later on and I was like, Bro, did you feel, he, he's like, brother, I've been feeling the spirit of heaviness and it seems like he's just getting heavier over the last three to four weeks. We began to talk and, and I just need you to understand, and this is what much of my message is going to be about, that as you and I as believers begin to press in more towards the work, towards the Lord. As we begin to cry out for more of God and ask the Holy Spirit to show up, amen, and as people's lives begin to be really touched and people start to get healings in their bodies, in their minds, in their spirit, in their soul, and they begin to awaken to the things of God, what ends up happening is it's kind of like the proverbial, you poke the bear. You poke the bear because you get a, the attention of the, of the forces of darkness. Well, guess what? I, I'm, by, by the grace of God, we're not supposed to be worried about poking the bear. And I'm going to show you in the word of God how the bear gets poked all the time. The enemy gets poked all the time. And he wants to rise up his ugly head. And he wants to strike fear in the hearts and the lives of people. And he wants to make them sit down, shut up, and to just give up. And that's not the answer, child of God. The answer is, is that when the going gets, well, that's, that's something my daddy would have said. The answer is uh, that the kingdom of uh, God suffers violence and the violent take it by force. The, the, the answer is, is that we don't battle against flesh and blood, but against the principalities and spiritual wickedness, right? Against demonic entities. We're fighting a spiritual battle, church. I don't know if you believe that. I hope you can. I don't know where you are in your mind, how practical and logical you are. And, and it's okay to be logical. But listen, sometimes our logic gets in the way of the spirit. That's right. Yep. Sometimes our intellect gets in the way of the spirit. Yes, it does. You can be the smartest man in the world and you can miss Jesus. Amen. And so what I want you to know is, is that many people in this church believe that the enemy is getting a little bit riled up. But let me just tell you something. Maybe I'm thinking wrong. I tried, so I made a phone call. I had, what, well, I had Bill on the phone. I called, tried to call Patty, didn't answer at first. Tried to call Brittany. Tried to call Brother Kurt. But it's okay. It was late. All right? To get everybody, let's get somebody on the call. I can't come over here right now, but let's get us on the call. Let's get to, the, let's get to this. They ain't going to do us a whole lot of good to keep talking about it. Let's go on and let's just touch the throne room of God. So we ended up with, it was me, Bill, and Pat on the phone, and we started to talk. And at one moment, you're going to see the spot. Pat made a comment. Because, listen, and this is what I said. I said, Solomon gave a word that this church, he didn't say the preacher. Oh, he said a lot of good things about the preacher. But he said, this church was going to be a harvesting combine. I'm going to keep saying it to you. The, prof the prophetic anointing of a seer. That's a whole other story. I believe you got that gift, Wade. The seer. People that see visions and dreams and the Lord responds with a word. He, when the second time I talked to Solomon on the phone, he's like, did I say harvesting combine? Yes, you did. He said, I see it again. Wow. You ever seen a sugar cane tractor going through the field and shooting sugar cane in the truck that's driving on yeah. the side of it? That's souls coming into the kingdom of God. Yeah. And I was telling the men I was on the phone with, let me tell you something, brother. We ain't even barely put no diesel in the tractor yet. <laughs> and so if the enemy's getting riled up and we can't even get through this speed bump, we're going to be in a world of hurting, my friend. But we ain't got to be in a world of hurting because he that is in us is greater than he that is in the world. And what we need, though, is we need those that are already called to intercession. What does that mean, to intercede? It means to cry out to God, to touch the throne room of God, and to ask God to pour out His Spirit. Why do we want God to pour out His Spirit? I'm going to tell you what we pray when we pray here. We pray for you. 
Right. We pray for you that when you show up in this place, the Holy Spirit will minister to your heart. He will minister to your mind. He will become more real on the inside. Yes. He will hear your, heal your physical body. You will begin to hear his, his voice more clearly. He will come against the spirits of oppression that are trying to make you bow down. He will, yeah. he will root the ways of the world out of your heart. He will give you a renewed mind of Christ. That's what we're praying. And we're praying that whenever he does that to you, that you're going to go outside these walls and you're going to testify. And we've been praying that when you testify, the power of heaven will be behind your words and it will reach into those people's hearts and it's going to grab a hold of them and it's going to change them. That's what we're praying. Yes. That's a good prayer. Because yes. that's, that's the prayer of a harvest in yeah. You understand what I'm trying to say? All right. Let me not get too, too excited. Hallelujah. I'm going to teach this morning. So listen. Don't get lost. Try not to fall asleep on me. Amen. Holy Spirit, we need your help. Give us supernatural wisdom and understanding. Amen. So listen, this is just a graphic right here to try to describe the three part of the human being. The spirit, the soul, the body. Quickly, I just want you to see in the middle is the spirit. I wrote in there with red, Holy Spirit. I need you to understand that you are a spirit. Spiritual beings will live for eternity. The spirit never dies. I was talking to a woman yesterday at work. She said, I'm just having a hard time with the eternity thing. I said, sis, you don't want to miss that. You don't want to let your mindset prevent you from understanding you are a spiritual being. And your spirit is going to live for eternity. And your soul is who you are. As you can see in the blue, it's made up of the mind, the will. The emotions. I get that straight out of the Greek New Testament. I'm not making this stuff up. Your soul is who you are as an individual. It's what makes Pamela, Pamela, Jean, Jean. It's what makes mother dear back there, mother dear back there. It's what makes you, you. That's right. Your unique individuality is different than mine. You are an individual person. Do you understand that? The occult world wants you to believe that when you die, you become part of the spirit in the sky. There was an old song in the 70s. Oh, the spirit in the sky. No, that's Buddhism. That's karma, dharma. And then you finally become a butterfly. And then you finally come to, you go from being an ant to a roach to a butterfly. And then something. No, 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 no. You're not going to become part of the spirit in the sky. You're an eternal spirit. And if you didn't receive Christ, you're going to end up in an eternal hell. And your individuality is going to contain all of your memories. And I told her that. And I said, listen, you're going to remember these conversations. I'm not trying to scare you. Fear is not going to bring anybody in. I'm trying to tell you the truth. I'm trying to tell people the truth. That you will remember the people that God sent your way. See, that's why you and I got to get our head right. That's why we got to get our heart right. Because this life is not about the things that we have. This life is not about material possessions. It's not about our good jobs. Hallelujah for good jobs. Hallelujah for any job. The word of God says that he does, doesn't work is worse than an infidel. He says he that doesn't work doesn't eat. Okay. I mean, if the Lord got, got you, he's taking care of you. I mean, Brother Larson said he got checks sent to his mailbox the whole time he was in college. Hallelujah. You working for the Lord, my friend. That's the best boss you could ever have. Amen. You know, he got the whole the top on a thousand hills. Hallelujah. But your soul, I want you to understand, it, it includes your mindsets. I mean, what, what kind of things can affect your soul? I'm about to dig a little bit deep. Games can affect. I'm not, listen, don't get all frustrated with me if I start talking about your little thing. I'm just trying to speak truth. You spend all day long on a gaming device and you think that that can't begin to affect your mindsets. You spend all day because you, and she may watch and it's okay since nobody knows you and I'm not going to say you know. She said, look at this, what I got, I got a new piano. She said, I mean, I don't want to learn how to play Beethoven, but I like that Snoop Dogg. So I would let the whole conversation go on a little bit. Okay, don't get mad at me, but this is what I told her. At the right time, after we had talked about eternity, after we talked about Jesus for about 20, 30 minutes, after I could see she was in there, and I started to talk to her about what I was going to preach this morning. And I said, but listen to me. 
We can sometimes have our own opinions and sometimes our opinions can be wrong. And we can sit here and we can endeavor to learn Snoop Dogg and him smoking 30 spliffs a day. And I can tell you right now that is not going to be of the Lord. It's not going to be conducive to your spirit, man, being coming alive to the things of God. But you go ahead, Christian. No, I'm talking not to the people in there. I'm talking to you on video, whoever you are. You go ahead, Christian, and you keep letting Snoop Dogg speak into your life. You keep letting those musical people speak into your life and their lyrics of lies that they speak into you. Listen, stop for a second. Please do me a favor if you still listen to secular music and listen to what they're speaking into your life. Well, I don't listen to hip hop. Okay. I just Googled a song 10 years ago when I was doing T and it was a top country. I'm going to take my beer. And sit right here and drown my tear. Oh. I mean, what as good is that going to do? So you're going to take marijuana, take alcohol, take pills to try to drown the lies or the pain or the heartache or the sorrows that are taking place in the world instead of coming to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords yeah. and you wonder why you're sitting there. Right? And, and you're going to let other people speak into your life instead of letting the Lord speak into your life. Don't hate me when I get to preaching good. Because I'm trying to tell you the truth. I want to help you. But listen, if you sit back, no, I'm talking to you on the video. If you sit back there and you're angry and you're about to stop and press pause, it's because that is your flesh. That is your flesh. When I say something, if it's true, that you don't like, oh, but you say it's true. Yeah, no, I'm saying that the Holy Spirit wants you to know. If you're not coming to Jesus, that God the Father sent to set you free and you're going to something else, you are living a lie. And that brings us to the outer shell, which is the body. And I put flesh on both sides, but it's also your members because it includes your hands. It includes your ears. It includes your eyes. See, the flesh, though, is a little bit different than just your body. See, the flesh, you got to understand, it has to be animated by life. So there is some type of a connection with the flesh and the soul, meaning the mind. you got to understand that. Without, the, without that living part of us, which is the soul and the spirit, which is the inner man, then the, then the flesh or the body is just a clump of clothes on the ground. There's got to be something that causes the body to want to listen to the wrong thing, to do the wrong thing, to, right? And so there's a connection between the mind or the soul, the individual, to the flesh, to make the flesh reach out for sin. And when we put more sin in, we start to cause a decrease in the Holy Spirit's power inside of our spirit. I got good news for you. If you're a new Christian, I think we might have a couple of people in here that recently you gave your heart to the Lord. I want to congratulate you. I'm not trying to talk or rededicated your heart. I want you to understand in that spirit thing right there. And I used this scripture Wednesday night where I put Holy Spirit. That's the Bible teaches this. I'm not going to go through all the scriptures. There's multiple Ezekiel 36, John chapter 16. When you got saved, let me tell you what happened to you. Because you don't even know yet what happened to you. When you truly got saved, the Holy Spirit came to live on the inside of your spirit. He renewed your spirit. He made your spirit, that eternal part of who you are, he made it come alive to him. That's what makes you different than a dog. Dogs are cute. I love my dog, but my dog is not a man. It's a living soul, but it does not have the capacity in its spirit to come alive to God. You, on the other hand, had the capacity to come alive to to God. If you have not yet received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then you're not alive to God. If you have received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and you continue to put the games, the music, the drugs, the alcohol, the illicit sex, the fornication, all of the sins that are outside the Word of God and the will of God, is it okay still in 2023 to preach the truth? When you keep putting all of that stuff on the inside of you, what you're doing is you're bringing your human spirit down and you're giving power to the enemy to hold sway over your life. But listen, no, 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 no. Don't sit back thinking you got your safe because it may not be sex, drugs, and rock and roll. It might be other things. It might be spiritual pride. It might be jealousy. 
It may be in. See, the enemy, look at this, look at on the outside in the perimeter, lust of the eye, lust of the flesh, pride of life. These are temptations. Temptations from the outside trying to come in, trying to grab a hold of your mind and make your members reach out and grab them and bring them into you. And the Holy Spirit on the inside of you, he's also speaking to your mind. And he's saying, won't you use your members for me? You need some scripture? Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6 towards uh, around verses 13 through 15. Don't let your members be used as weapons of warfare for unrighteousness. Let your members, your hands, your eyes, your mouth, your ears be used as weapons of warfare for righteousness. Now what your hands used to grab that was sin, now your hands reach out and grab the things of God. I'm going to grab the word of God, not in a system of works, but because it's the word of truth. It's the truth. It's the belt of truth that I gird my loins with, that holds my breastplate of righteousness in place because I live in the midst of a sin-filled, wicked world that's trying to get my feet dirty, my heart dirty, my mind dirty. Then they try it through Hollywood and music and all of these other things. Secular, the psychology, all of these, the social media, trying to dirty my mind, trying to convince me transgender's okay, trying to convince me homosexual. What are we going through here? What in the world is happening in this world that we're living in? Telling us that it was okay to abort dead babies. What is going on, church? But we're asleep. We've been lulled to sleep. We've been like the little frog in the pot. And the fire was stoked low. And then we've been being accustomed to it. We've gotten acclimated to it. It's affecting our mind, our will, our emotion. The enemy wants to come in there and listen to me. He wants to grab a hold of your will. He wants to say, you're going to yield to me. You're going to yield to me. And then when we yield to him, because every last one of us in this place has yielded to the evil one. And sometimes even after we've been believers. And when we yield to him, you know what he does? You want to know what he does? He starts jacking with your emotions. Oh, yep. He puts the spirit of fear on you. Mm-hmm. Puts anxiety on you. Oh, right. the dude, they don't change. I'm, listen, I don't know how much longer I'm going to be on, but I'm a nurse practitioner. I've been practicing for 26 years. I have seen healthcare change. Everybody is on depression. Mm-hmm. You, I recommend you do not go to the doctor tomorrow for a cut finger. Well, I don't have any suture material, so I can't sew you up. So if you need sutures, go see Gabe or something. Okay, but listen to me. I do not recommend you go to the doctor because she's tired. <laughs> You're going to walk out of there on depression medicine. That's right. Yeah, that's right. I don't recommend you go in there for that's right. body aches. You're going to walk out of there on depression medicine. That's right. I'm, I'm just trying to make a point. Listen to me. I'm not picking on people that are on depression medicine right now. I'm trying to make a point that this is where we are in the world. Everybody is being overly medicated and it's not really helping because that's not the problem. The problem is Jesus. Oh, but I tried to know Jesus like my brother-in-law Aaron said one time when we were on Bourbon Street (coughs) preaching Jesus. Do you don't try Jesus? Jesus is in a pair of shoes Uh and you think he doesn't fit so you take him off and you throw him back in the closet. Dude, I love that when he told that dude. No, 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 no. He said, we're all burned. No, you don't try on Jesus. You don't take him off because you don't like the way he feels him and throw him in the closet. Jesus is the king of glory. You receive him into your heart and you let him live on the inside of you and you let him grow and you feed the truth in your spirit. You go from the things of the world to the things of God and you let God have his way in your heart and in your life. That's it. So that's what this is. I wasn't planning on sending that much time on it, but I'm going to keep on hitting because listen to me. You open up doors. Yep. You open up doors. We open up doors. I open up doors. Yep. To the enemy. We're so far from biblical Christianity, everybody's thinking, oh, the love of God. You know what the love of God looks like? God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the other. God's love is beautiful. God's love is compassionate. He is long-suffering. He has long-suffered with me. He has long-suffered with you. But listen to me. He judges sin, my friend. And I don't mean to be rude, but the, the, the way that the church world is right now, and they ain't more worried about how many people are sitting in the seats and they ain't more worried about an offering. Right. And they can't tell the truth anymore. Come on now. That's, gonna, that's a problem. Because God is getting angrier 
by the day. And I don't want him getting angry with me. My friend. And he told me a long time ago, present my word for the way that it's written and I will use you. And I'm still learning what that means. Amen. All right. So that's that. I wanted to remind you of that. And so we also use some temple scriptures. You remember that? We use some scriptures out of Corinthians. It said that you are the temple of God. You remember that? There's at least two of them. You are the temple of God. Did you not know that you are the temple of God and that the spirit of God lives in you? Now, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the temple and the tabernacle. These are Old Testament thoughts. But you know what's so cool about the tabernacle and the temple? The spirit of God lived on the inside. I love the concept of the tabernacle because it was mobile. So they were carrying the spirit of God around with them as they traveled. But I love the concept of the temple because it's more representative of the church that when you and I have the spirit of God. See now, because we're like a tabernacle now, the spirit of God lives on the inside of us. So everywhere we go, we carry him with us. And when we all congregate together, it's kind of like the temple. We're bringing the spirit of God on the inside of you. I want you to remember that much of my message today is how the enemy is coming against what God is doing. Whether it be in this church, in the world, whatever's going on, the enemy will not quit in your individual life, in this church. He's not going to quit. He is going to keep trying to frustrate and he's going to try to cause you to open a door yes. so that he can get in. And I don't even care where you think the enemy lives in believers. If you want to think he lives on your shoulder, or, or but he, I can assure you, he's messing with people. He's messing with every last one of us. That's right. And when we open the door and yield, he's either sitting on your shoulder, and if you let him hang out long enough, yep. he's getting in there. Yep. Yep. And I personally believe it's in the soulless realm. Mm -hmm. Because the mind, and then listen, let me just say this. Why would we have to be told that we need a renewed mind if our yeah. soul is completely saved? Right. Right. Why would 1 Thessalonians 5 and 23 say that the Lord wants to holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, yes. sanctify you soul, body, spirit? Because right. we have not completely been sanctified. That's and right. we will not. We're in the process of <coughs> sanctification. And one day we will be glorified. All right. So we use temple scriptures to bring the point out that you are the temple of God and that the spirit of God lives on the inside of you. And also comparing the temple is where I was going to go to the soul. Right. All right. The house. Now I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the house, because not only does the scripture describe the fact that we're like a temple, but the scripture also describes the fact in the New Testament that we're like a house. Look here, right? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1. Let's just start reading. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle, this is the Apostle Paul, mighty scholar of God, right, were dissolved, meaning that with this body that we're living in today was done away with, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. You know what he's talking about right there? One day you're going to receive a glorified body. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. For in this when we're here, we're groaning. In this concept, we're groaning. Why? Because we desire, we earnestly desire to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. Because, see, this earth is full of pain, it's full of sorrow, it's full of heartache. And many times, not all the time, it's our acts of disobedience that cause us to walk out from under the will of God. Somebody filtered through somebody else and said it's not just acts of disobedience. Sometimes it's traumatic events that allow the enemy to yes. come in. Yes. Right. Sometimes people are children and they're treated improperly, That's like right. sexually abused. Right. All kinds of things can happen. And that wasn't their fault. But many times instead of people turning to Jesus and letting them heal them, what do they do? They turn to other things. And instead of making it better, they only make it worse. Right? And so... Anyway, there's pain, there's heartache, there's sorrow, but there's coming a day where the Word of God says in Romans chapter 8 that there will be no more sorrow. There will be no more pain. There will be no more tears. This is the life and belief of the Christian. This is what the Lord would want you to understand if you read his whole word. I'm trying to give you a cliff note every time I get up here. I give a lot of information, but it's a condensed version of the whole of the Word of God. God wants you to understand that your life is not your own. God wants you to understand the life that you're living today is temporary. God wants you to understand that the way you live your life today is going to affect your eternity. God wants you to understand that there's something so much greater, so much more powerful, so much more beautiful that is waiting for you yeah. in heaven. A glorified 
eternal body that's going to live with him, that you're going to be in communion and love with him, that you're going to rule and reign with him, that you are going to be kings and priests of your God. And guess what? He's given us a down payment today. We can walk in that anointing today. And he wants us to spread it around to others that are hurting, okay? So we groan. We want to be clothed upon with our house from heaven. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. Boy, there's a lot to this. You can go all the way back to the garden, but we, we're going to take our time. Here. For we that are in this tabernacle groan. We're being burdened. This is the apostle Paul. He's admitting we're being burdened. We're being waited upon. Life is burdensome. But he wants to give us grace. He wants to give us strength. Even in the midst of the burdens, in the midst of the frustrations, he wants us to learn how to turn to him so that we can draw our strength from him. So we're being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he has wrought us for the self same thing as God, that who has also given unto us the earnest of the spirit. Therefore, while we are, we are confident, knowing that while we're at home in the body, we're absent from the Lord. It's a natural tendency for us as believers to want the next thing. Just wait, Lord, till I finally get married, right? Just wait, Lord, till I can have a child. Just, no, 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 no. Just, just wait, Lord, till I can have a grandchild. Oh, but, but, but Lord, I really want one of those gladiator Jeep trucks. I would really like one. I really would jack it up a little. Yeah. Oh, but, but, but Lord, maybe, maybe just a little bit of, just, just hold on. No, no, no. Something's wrong if that's our mindset. That's right. Now, maybe just one more soul. One more soul. Yeah. Uh, just, no, just be a little bit more long suffering, Lord. You've been long suffering because you're, you're waiting. You, you're, you're long suffering because you want all men to come to repentance. One more soul. See, now if our mind's thinking that way, now we're getting a little bit closer yeah. to the heart of the Lord. Yeah. But if we're so caught up in this earthly, temporary place that we're living, we're missing the will of God. All right, you get the point. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, that would, now I want to also talk to you about this house in Matthew chapter, but I got to be careful. Matthew chapter 12, verses 22. Through 25. That's the place where Jesus cast that devil out of that possessed man. You remember that? He was deaf and dumb. And, and then the Pharisees started accusing him of casting out devils by the prince of devils, Beelzebub. And that's an interesting thing. I'm not going to turn to it because it takes too much time. But if, for you Bible scholars, or should we call ourselves Bible nerds since we're not really scholars. Because a true scholar can actually read Hebrew. <laughs> that just know a couple of little alphabet letters. Okay, now nah, they really read this stuff. But we could call ourselves word nerds for sure, right? And y'all got that little app in y'all's phone, some of y'all, that olive tree. When you go back home and you check out Beelzebub and you click on that, see, I always thought it meant Lord of the Flies because that is some of the words that it uses to describe that. But you know what it says in that text? Lord of the house. Ooh. Oh, come on. He wants to own the house. Wow. He wants to kick the Lord out and he wants to move in. And whenever the Lord says, how do you, how do you take, take the spoil? What, that means that in war, you take what belongs, the, the leftovers. See, Jesus is coming down here. He said, you think I've come to bring priests upon the earth? Nay, but a sword. To divide father from mother. To divide brother from sister. Why? Why would you bring division? Because anything that stands between you and me, it must go in the name of Jesus. Yeah, that's right. He said, I've come to bring a sword. Come on. He's a man of war, my friend. That's right. He is a, the darling of heaven. He is the lamb of God. He is so full of love and compassion and mercy. But he is a man of war. And he's coming to take this earth back. And he said, I've come to bind the strong man. He came to bind the strong man. But listen, it's not just the strong man on the earth. It's the strong man that is actually wreaking <laughs> havoc in people's individual lives. And I'm trying to tie all this together to let you know that this message turned into something bigger than just our individuality. This message in that phone call with Pat and Bill turned into a message for this church. And I did not even realize that that's what the Lord was brewing. But we're being attacked already from the outside. But he's trying to get in the house, my friends. Yes. He's trying to get in your house and in your head. Don't think about demonic possession right now because that's not even what I'm talking about. No. Stop that for me, please, just for a second because I'm trying to communicate something. He's trying to get into your mind and he's trying to bring, get you to bring that in here. Yeah. 
whoever you are. Before this is over with, I'm going to use myself as an illustration. So you can just rest calm. I'm not using anybody else but good old Brother Matt as the illustration. I'm about to just release again, hopefully, humility. Because I wouldn't have wanted, but, but the Lord prepared me to speak this. And now's the time to speak. All right? So, the house. We're likened to a temple. We're likened to a house. Look at this. First Chronicles 28, 11. Then David gave Solomon, his son, the plan of the vestibule of the temple and of its houses, its treasuries. Look at this. Its upper rooms. Check that out. Its upper rooms, its inner chambers and of the room for the mercy seat. First Chronicles 28, 12. And the plan of all that he had in mind for the courts of the house of the Lord, all the surrounding chambers. The treasuries of the house of God and the treasuries for dedicated gifts. What am I trying to say? I'm trying to let you know the temple were being likened like by Paul to be in a temple. Houses have rooms. The temple had rooms. And I'm going back to your soul. I'm going back to your mind. I'm going back to your life journey. I'm going back to all of the things that have happened. Possible. To, I'm not teaching psychology. I'm teaching psychology. The soul, suke, the word of God. I'm teaching that you are an intricate individual. I'm teaching that you have been traumatized in life. I'm teaching that you have learned patterns in your mind. You have allowed pride to rise up on the inside of you. You have built protective barriers and walls so that you would not continue to be hurt. And even if you ain't got demons in you, hallelujah, because you shouldn't. Even if you ain't got demons in you, there are places deep down on the inside of who you are that you have not yielded to the Lord. And you have held on to some of those pains. You have held on to some of those circumstances. And you said, oh, Lord, I'm going to give you this, but I'm not going to give you this. I'm going to hold on to this. I'm going to cling to it. I don't want and in pride. You and I refuse. To let him in to some of those places that the psalmist was saying, search me, Lord. Search me, Lord. Have your way with me. Come into this place. Show me, Lord. Have your way. So going back to the human and going back to the body, the soul, the spirit, you could also liken it to the temple in that the inner court. And I'm going to show you a graphic in a moment is like the flesh or the external aspect of the body. The holy place is like the soul. It's the next level in. And the holy of holies is like the spirit. And look, 1 Corinthians 6 and 17. I just want to remind you, I've already said it once. This is the place that when you invited Jesus in, it says it. Your spirit has been made one with the spirit of God. That is a beautiful thing, my friend. The spirit of God lives on the inside of you. You are the temple of God. Hallelujah. Now look, here's the graphic. I want you to just kind of look. I don't know if I can maybe draw a couple of things here, but this, is, this would be the inner court over here. This would be the inner court where, uh, I'm going to go ahead and use red, this altar. This is considered the inner court, the outside. Then you go in to the holy place right here. This is where the lamp stands. Where This is Solomon's temple, altar of incense right here. Table of showbread right here. Look, see this right here? Most holy place. That's where the presence of the Lord was. The Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat, okay? But look at this right here. This is the chambers and the rooms that we just read about in Chronicles. Let me show you something. Look at this little cool thing. Look, boom, Temple of Solomon. Oh, it didn't do it for me. Isn't that about right? Okay. Oh, why is it going to play with me? Did I mess this thing up? No, oh, there we go. Interactive, baby. Temple of Solomon. Now, look, this is from the Jewish Encyclopedia. I didn't agree with everything in this article, but let's just go ahead and see what the Jews say about the temple. I'm going to scroll down to the structure for you construction guys, all right? The structure was three stories in height. The wall was not of equal thickness all the way up, but had ledges on which the floor beams rested. Around the structure was a series of chambers of varying size because of the differences in the thickness of the wall. Those of the lowest story, five cubits in depth. Those of the second, six. 
Those of the third, seven, the temple was also provided with windows and fixed lattice work. What is the point? The point is, is again, this is where those rooms are. They were part of the structure. And just as your heart and your mind, your soulish person has hidden things in there over today, but really Wednesday, we're going to talk about how things can be hidden in this temple. And at the same time, God has not left yet. And he's in the same place with all of this wickedness and this uncleanness. And let me tell you something. Thank the Lord that he doesn't leave us fast. Thank the Lord because he wants to stay with us, Christian, because he loves us and he wants to help us. But let us understand that if we refuse, if we stiffen our neck, oh, people don't like this kind of preaching, but this is the kind of preacher I am. If we stiffen our neck and harden our heart and let our head become like flint, we're contending with the most God. And we're expecting him to bless our life. Oh, I'm telling you something that's going to help you, my friend. Because, see, Jesus died on the cross so that you and I could have access to grace. Grace is powerful in the Holy Ghost. The definition of grace is a divine influence on the heart and its reflection in the life. That means he wants to do an inside job. He wants to, and if you will yield to him and let him come in and have his way, he will do a work on the inside of you and empower you to line yourself up under the authority of the word of God. That's it. That's it. That's good. And when true repentance takes place and says, Lord, here's my temple. Here's my mind. Here's my bad spots. Here's my hurts. Here's my heartaches. Right. I'm going to quit covering them up with all this other stuff. Whatever that stuff is, I'm not going to name it. I've done enough naming. You pick it up. Whatever it is. And I'm going to yield to you. And I'm going to submit my will to your will. Is that not the word of our, of our Savior? Yes. Father, not my will, but your will be done. Amen. Amen. Yeah. So to examine the range. We're talking about examination. We're talking about searching. Real quick, I just want to give you this. This is the word in the Hebrew. This comes out of the Hebrew. It says to root or to test, especially metals. I love the idea of testing metals. This is the work of a smith. Where you heat up the metal, we've heard of that before. The proverb says, remove the dross from the vessel and comes forth a vessel worthy of the refiner. Dross is impurities. You, each and every one of us have impurities in our life. And when you heat up the metal and you get it to where it becomes molten and you heat it up enough, what happens is the impurities start to come to the top. See, when God allows the heat to be raised in your life, through trial and tribulation, through situation and circumstance, and you keep going to the things of the world, then you're not getting to the place where the Lord wants you. But if you push all that stuff to the side and you start allowing him to have his way and he heats it up. See, now you're submitting. I told that lady at the church, uh, at, the, at work yesterday, I said, listen to me. You become stiff necked like the children of Israel. And you, I, said, I said, listen to me. I'm sorry. I don't mean to be rude, but you're, you're in this conversation and you're staying. So let me just go ahead and say this. The, the clay doesn't tell the potter what to do. All right, <laughs> Excuse me? No, no, no. The clay doesn't tell the potter what to do. And when the clay tells the potter what it's going to do, you know what happens? It becomes all mangled. You ever seen the potter's wheel? The clay just gets all twisted up. Boom. Flops over. No. no. You, you're not going to. He, tell, he told Jeremiah, go down to the potter's house and I'm going to tell you, look at the more clay. Tell Israel they're like more clay. But if they will put themselves in the hands of the man. Hallelujah. Who, who, and you will let him wield it. And put a little bit of water on man. And water the spirit. Keep yourself in his hand. Woo, he's working at just the right speed. And he's making a beautiful vessel. I know. I'm a weirdo. But it's good. Hallelujah. I got Jesus in my heart, man. How you know, preacher? Because I was a piece of marred clay, my friend. Oh my God. Thank you, Jesus. And I'm learning <laughs> to keep my hand in the hand of the man yeah. who yeah. steals the yeah. yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. So look, to investigate, to examine, to put to proof, to put to the trial. 
We can call ourselves Christian all day long, my friend, but if we don't go through it and we don't come out on the other side by holding on to the hem of his garment, then we just have a bunch of words. That's it. Yep. That's it. Look at these scriptures. I'm just going to read them to you because you probably can't read them, but I'm going to read them to you. Jeremiah 11, 20. But, O oh Lord of hosts, that judge righteously, that tries the reins, R-E-I-N-S. I'm going to talk to you. And the heart. Let me see your vengeance on them. He's talking about people coming against them. And he said, Lord, you're the one that judges and tries the rain. Let your vengeance fall upon my enemies that are trying to come against me. Look what the psalmist said in Psalm 26 too. Examine me, O Lord. Prove me. Try my reins in my heart. What is a rain? It's your innards. It's an old King James word for talking about the liver and the call and the kidneys. <laughs> See, I, I had the privilege of seeing a surgeon, whether you want to call it a privilege or not. When I was a nursing student, he cut that open, he split that abdomen open, he started pulling them intestines out. Had a pile of intestines on the operating. What is your point, preacher? My point is that's what the high the priest did to the animal side. That's right. Mm -hmm. It had to be without spot or blemish. We're not just talking about a piece of sore on the outside. That thing had to be flayed open, opened up, and inspected. They had to run their hands across those intestines to make sure there was no tumor in there. They had to pull those livers out, the liver out. They had to pull the kidneys out. They had to inspect them. That's what the psalmist is saying. Flay me open, Lord, just like the Old Testament sacrifice. Search me, oh God. He's not saying, let me keep hiding those things. Let me keep holding on to my traumatic events. Let me keep... Uh, they hurt me. And listen, I'm not trying to make fun. Look, I, I've hurt people. And if you think I'm happy about that, I'm not. This is just how I talk. I love people. There's other things I can say, but we got time. No, I'm going to say it. You know, I was a bully in school. I was a bully in school. I picked on people. And, and listen, now, I got, I got what I had coming to me, though. Some of you took me we went through the woods. I learned something like that then. But that's okay. I did. No, I'm done. Yes, I was done. I got a hand for you. And I need it. But, but let me tell you something. I was a bully. And nowadays in school, I, I'm speaking to, we've got a couple of young people in here. I hope you're not a bully. Don't be a bully. But look, I was a bully, and now they say bully free zone. And I got these kids that come into the clinic and they like fill out their depression screen and they're about to do it. And I had this girl tell me one time and she was like telling me all the things that happened. I had enough at that point. moment. It was just that principle that felt my little bit of wrath. I called her up. I couldn't really do nothing. I couldn't change nothing. I just felt like telling somebody something. Because I wanted to be a principal at that point, but I can't be a principal. I'm not going to be, maybe one day I'll be a principal and a pastor and a, all kind of other stuff. Who knows? <laughs> but I said, man, and I told her, I said, y'all keep telling everybody you got a bully free zone, it's full of bull. And I'm tired of it. So somebody, you just happen to be the ones going to heal what I got to say today. Oh, sir, I got to go get my superintendent. I said, good, go get your superintendent, put me on speakerphone because we're about to talk. And I told her what I thought. I, I, I think it's a bunch of googly goo. They're just saying a bunch of things to try to make it sound good. I had a girl, 15 years old. I told y'all the story. She's coming there with a bruise all over her arm. And I said, what happened to your arm, girl? It was my 15th birthday. That dude grabbed me and he punched me 30 times in the same arm. I'm like, sweetheart, you didn't try to get away? Yes, I did. I was crying. I told him to let me go. Oh, but he's on the track team. He's on the football. Boy, I wish I could go talk to that football coach. I wish I could go talk to that principal and say, how dare you? Do not be a bully. Amen. God hates bullies. The devil's a bully. And we're about to get into it. We haven't even got into the message yet. But this is what the Lord wants us to do. He wants us to allow him to examine the inside of who we are and to deal with us. Amen. So here's where we're going. We're going to the law. Y'all remember that? Nehemiah. We were, this is where we were leaving whenever we left on Wednesday night. Y'all remember that? I said, what's the one word? And I gave a little hint, and then I'm going to say her name. Jessica said, the wall. Y'all remember that? Yes. I right. What does that make you feel like when I call out Jessica? I know it makes her feel weird. But does it make you irritated? Because I'm going to get somewhere with that. I, mean, I, I don't think it does. No. But whenever I start talking about other people, I'm like, man, Pat's really interceding for you guys. Is that, well, who's Pat 
anymore. I'm not saying Bill Fry's name. Who's Bill Fry, Johnny? Completely. I'm not saying that it does do that, but listen to me. Be careful, Christian, because Pastor Matt's about to open up his heart at the end of this message. So stay tuned. <laughs> got to be careful. Yeah. The devil got tricky tricks. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the wall. Let's talk a little bit about Nehemiah. All right, this is the history. I'm going to give you a little bit of a history lesson, but then we're going to get into some scripture. And I want to show you what the enemy's trying to do. What he's trying to do is you as an individual, what he wants to do to the work of God. The wall represents a lot of things. It represents the work of God. Okay? But it represents a lot of things. So this is a time frame in Israel's history after the Babylonian captivity. Do you realize if you read the whole of the Bible, you will see the people of God constantly in rebellion against God? It's a sad thing. It, it will convict your heart. If you ever read the whole Bible, and especially if you read it more than once, there's going to be times that you're reading the word of God, and you're going to be like, Lord, forgive me. God, you're so good. You love your people. And look what they keep doing to you. Look what I've done to you. You will, I'll promise, if you have the Spirit of God. You will see yourself in the life of Israel. Yeah. With that in mind, Israel had been disobedient. Remember, we're going to start at Solomon. What did Solomon do? He disobeyed the Word of God. Yep. He married women that he wasn't supposed to marry. That's why when the Word of God says, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers, you're not supposed to marry or to date unbelievers. Does it happen sometimes? Yes. Sometimes people get married before they're even believers. So now we're going to hold on to the Lord and we're going to learn. I'm going to pray for our spouse and believe that they get saved. That's the answer to that. Amen. And we're going to yield our lives to the Lord. But look, Solomon, the reason God did not want them to intermarry was because he, God knew that they were going to draw his, people's hearts away from God and draw them towards their own God. Nowadays, you might not be necessarily worshiping the statue of Mary, but you might if you marry the wrong person. Yeah. But you might start falling into what they do. You could be a born-again Christian. You could even be spirit-filled. And if you, in your own will, with your own emotions, fall prey to the lies of Satan, you could connect yourself to another vessel that still drinks, still parties, still listens to the wrong thing. And the next thing you know, you sucked right in there, baby. Sucked right up in there. And he got you right where he wants you. And he's going to hold you in that little spot in bondage until you cry out to the Lord. So this is where Israel is. The kingdom becomes split. And from that time moving forward, every king almost, not everyone, Josiah is a glimmering ray of hope and light. And we don't have time to get into him right now. But for the most times, these kings, you know what they do? They're full of idolatry. Right. They're worshiping false gods. God sends the prophets Turn from your wicked ways. But what do the people do? They try for a little while. They fall back in. Try for a little while. Fall back in. And then finally captivity comes. They go grab Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach. Y'all remember the story? Bring them to Babylon. And that night, that, remember the handwriting on the wall? Many, many, tekel, uparshin. What is the interpretation? You have been weighed in the scales and found wanting this night. Your kingdom is taken from you. Went from Babylon to Persia. Poof, that fast in one night. And so that's where we are in Nehemiah. See, the 70 years of captivity are up. And Nehemiah is, we don't even know where he comes from. We don't know what tribe he's from. We know his daddy's name. We know maybe his brother's name because his brother shows up. And that's how the story starts. He said, my brother showed up with some of the other guys from Judah because you see Ezra, the scribe. I know some of you don't know these people's names, but how will you ever know their names if I don't try to introduce you to them? How will you ever know these people if I don't talk about them? I've been lambasted by preachers all my life. You talk too deep. You can, no, 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 no. If people aren't going to read their Bible, I'm going to talk to you about the Bible. I'm not saying you're not reading your Bible. Maybe you are. But guess what? I hope that by talking to you about the Word of God, it'll stir it in you and you'll want to read the Word of God. You'll want to learn the Word of God. Because it's relevant for your life, my friend. So Ezra, the Lord releases. Now the captivity is almost over, is near it gets in. God releases Ezra to rebuild the temple. The house of God. The place where the Spirit of God lives with God's people. But Nehemiah has found himself in a position in the, in the, the presence of the Persian king. He's the cupbearer. That means he's the one that brings the king his 
cup of wine or whatever it is the king's drinking. Here you go, king. He's trusted. He's risen to a place where he has access to the king. His brother and some other guys from Judah come and he says, how are the guys doing that are still over there in the land? It's bad, Nehemiah. It's bad. The walls are broke down. The stones for the walls are burnt up. We're living as slaves in the land that God gave us. It's bad. And Nehemiah, you know what he does? Oh, I think we need to do a series on Nehemiah. You know what Nehemiah does when he finds himself in that situation? He fasts and he prays. <laughs> Hallelujah! He fasts and he prays. But even still, this heaviness is upon him. Sometimes we have heaviness on our hearts. It may not be a spirit of heaviness. It just might be spiritual heaviness. Mm -hmm. But he carried that into the presence of the king one day. And he said it. He said, I had never been sad countenance like that in the presence of the king. But guess what? God prepared the whole thing, my friend. Oh, God knows what he's doing. And he, and he goes in there and the king says, what's wrong with you? He says, how can I be joyful, king? The city that I come from, the place of my father's. The walls broke down, the stones are burnt, and he gets permission from the king with letters from the king to go back and start building the wall. Let me tell you something. Proverbs 25 and 28 says this. I said it Wednesday. That a man without self-control or restraint is like a city without walls. See, the word of God is prophetic even when you don't realize it because there's so many layers to the word of God. And what that would tell you if you put all this together is this. That wall was surrounding a city called Jerusalem and Jerusalem means peace. Mm -hmm. That city represents your heart. Mm -hmm. That God wants peace on the inside of your heart. That wall represents the protection of God. But when you and I, like Israel, come out from under the protection of God and are disobedient yeah, yeah. to the word of God, the wall gets broken down. Yes, yes. What is the purpose of a wall? The wall protects the city from the enemy. When the wall is broken down, the enemy can come into places where he was not supposed to have access. Those were places that were supposed to be restricted to the presence of the enemy. But because of God's people bringing themselves out from under the obedience of God, they allow the protection of God to be broken down and it allows the enemy to come in and he brings, he wreaks havoc and he, re, he brings destruction upon the land. But God knows how to bring healing. See, when you start building up the walls, what that means is that now you're repenting in the presence of God. You're bringing yourself back under the authority of God. And you know what he's doing? He's going to start building up the protection. Hallelujah. 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 With repentance, there comes refreshing. With repentance, there comes rebuilding. With repentance, there comes, if my people call by my name, will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked way, I will heal their land. There's a good yeah. word in that land. Yeah. Yes, yes. And you'll see it with your own eyes. It'll happen everywhere around you. The Spirit of God will start doing things and you're like, wow, that's all it took? Why was I so rebellious for so long? I don't know why we do that. Anyway. So so listen, so he goes, but look, he, he and so he begins his journey. To go back to Jerusalem to build the wall. All right, so now we're going to go look at some passages of Scripture. Y'all ready? Before we do, though, let me just tell you this. Sanballat and Tobiah. These guys represent the devil. These guys represent the forces of evil. Nehemiah represents the child of God. Nehemiah and the work and the tribes of Israel together represent this church. This whole thing represents the enemy from the outside trying to attack what God wants to do in this church. But what does God want to do in this church? He wants to do the same thing in this church he wants to do in every church. Amen. He wants to pour out his spirit. He wants to change your life yeah. and my life. He wants us to take that out there and to minister to other people. And hopefully they'll come back here, but they may not come back here. They might go to the church down the road. And guess what? I'm good with that. I'm happy to hear that you might have walked out of here and prayed for somebody else and that their life would be changed. God's going to honor that. Yeah. And if we'll seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then all the other things will be added unto us and he will add to the church daily. We don't have to worry about that. We don't have to stress about that. We just need to be about our father's business. We're not building the kingdom of Pastor Matt. I ain't got, I need to get out of the way. We need to let Jesus be the pastor. Hallelujah. And we need to let the kingdom of God go forward. Yes. 
Sam Lot and Tobiah are a problem, my friend. They want to get in your heart. They want to wreak havoc in the work of God. All right, here we go. Here's Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 10. When Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the servant, the Ammonite. Anybody remember real quick where the Ammonites came from? All right, I'm going to keep going. That was one of the Lot's daughters. You remember that? Yeah. When they heard of it, it grieved them exceedingly that there was come a man to seek the welfare of the children of Israel. Can I tell you something, child of God? Whenever the enemy hears that there's a people that are ready to do the work of God yes, and to yes. seek the welfare of people that are hurting, the enemy becomes grieved. The enemy becomes angry. Yeah. Oh, he's going to start stirring stuff up in your house, in your job, with your friends, with your family members. He's going to start causing an irritation. He's going to shake the hornet's nest. He's going to get you, and he's going to make you want to quit. And this is just the first stage. Mm -hmm. Nehemiah 2.18, and I told them of the hand of my God. Listen, this is different. This is not him telling Tobiah. This is whenever he gets to the city for three days, he don't even tell anybody what he's doing. He's on a recon mission. Mission. He's at nighttime and he's checking out the gates. He's looking at the walls. He's like, man, this place is a mess. But you know what? God's got a plan. And then he goes and he tells, he's talking, he goes and he tells the nobles and the rulers. He hadn't told them for three days. He goes and he tells the nobles and the rulers. He says, I told them of the hand of my God. Uh, that had been upon me for good and also of the words that the king had spoken to me and they said let us rise up and build so they strengthened their hands for the good work there's a couple of passages in here that reminded me of a text Brendan put on group on text church when he said let's lock arms together let's get to the church house of God and let's pray and I was thinking about this because look at this they said we rise up they strengthen themselves they strengthen their hands and later on it's like they lock in arms because they all on the wall and they're working together to do the work of the Lord to prepare so that God's presence could come back in and that the work of the kingdom could go forward. Hallelujah. 2.19, but when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite servant and Geshem the Arab heard of it, they jeered at us. See, that's the next thing. First he gets free and he gets mad. Then he's going to start sending mocking to you. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a big joke. Oh, I, you know how many times there's been that? I love it now when it happened. It used to freak me out. Now I love it. You believe in that? You better believe I believe in it. You don't believe it? You don't believe Jesus died for you, man? You better get with the program, buddy. Hey, you're going to get left behind. Do I believe it? You better believe it. But it, he hears. He makes fun. The enemy mocks. They jeered at us. They despise us. They said, what is this thing that you're doing? You're rebelling against the king. You don't even know what you're talking about, you lying devil. You're over here lying. The word of the Lord said the king gave him letters and permission. Yep. The word of the Lord says I'm free in Christ. The word of the Lord says Jesus already paid the penalty. The word of the Lord says Jesus defeated principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. The word of the Lord says I am the righteousness of Christ in Christ Jesus. The word of the Lord says I'm seated in Christ in heavenly places. The word of the Lord says I've been translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. The word of the Lord says I have power and authority in the name of Jesus. That's what the word of the Lord says, you lying devil. Come jeering at me late at night when I'm by myself. You lying devil. I'm not receiving your lies. Come on. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Verse 220, then I replied to them, the God of heaven will make us prosper. You don't need to worry about it, buddy. And we, his servants, will arise and build, but you... You, Sanballat, you, you lying devil, you have no portion or right or claim in Jerusalem. You have no right. You've been dethroned, you lying devil. You have no power. No. Power is in my Lord. Amen. Unity, side by side, this chapter three. You just got to understand that. They're working side by side. They're coming together. They're being strengthened. Okay. Nehemiah 4.1. Opposition to the work. Now when Sanballat heard that we were building the wall, he was angry and greatly enraged. Do you see what the devil does? 
He keeps coming. I don't want to give away all Bill's little secrets, but he told me that he was show, trying to show somebody how to weave. And he's like, because Bill, Bill told me, I didn't know this about it. He's a, you know, I weeded miles of grass. And he said, I was trying to tell this person, man, if you weed it like this, you hold it like this. Be like, oh, I know how to weed it. <laughs> so he said, I'll wait a little while, come back again. Try a little different approach. Hey, it's your, da, 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 da. I know what I'm doing, I know what I'm doing. Hey, come back around this way. See, but that's a good way. <clears throat> this is the bad way. The devil's always trying to find and most of his tactics are the same. Most of his tactics, and he doesn't have to change his tactics. He's just over there going and like, why, do, why should I change my plan? I'm not even going to change the bait on this one. I just got him like on the string. <laughs> I got the hook in their jaw. But then all of a sudden, whenever you, when that hook gets released, then, uh-oh, we well, done woke him up now. God, now I done tried my anger, done tried my greed, tried to scare him. Oh, but now, you know, now I'm angry, you know, and I'm going to get enraged. So he's really angry, he's greatly enraged, and he jeered, and he's making fun of them. Look what it says right here. So, and he said in the presence of his brothers and of the army of Samaria, what are these feeble Jews doing? And that's what he tries to whisper to believers' ears. You can't do this. You have to bow your knee to me and what I'm telling you to do. You can't just run off from here. He said, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore it for themselves? Will they sacrifice? Can you hear the, 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 the tone in his voice? Will they finish up in a day? Will they revive the stones of the heaps of... Let me just let you in on a little secret. They finished the wall, my friend. In despite of the lies... In spite of the opposition, they came together and they finished the wall. Let's let the cat out the bag right now. Well, will they finish up in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish and burned ones at that? Look at this one. Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him and said, yeah, what are they are building? Even if a fox goes up on it, it'll break down their stone wall. Look at that. He's just like clowning them. Bullying them. Trying to make them not believe in, the guy, in their God. Trying to make them believe. Listen to me. What does this have to do with me, preacher? I'm going to tell you. Whenever you've been struggling with something and the enemy's coming to you and telling you that you're hopeless and that you have no hope, he's a liar. And he's trying to tell you in a fox, you don't have enough strength in your little pinky to stand against me. You got to keep going. No, I ain't got to do what you tell me to do no more, devil. Yeah, yeah. No, I don't because I have power through the risen Savior, resurrection power. That's what I have in me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Jesus. Hallelujah. Yeah, to talk about foxes makes me think about Santa. I'll tell you what we're going to do with some foxes. We're going to grab a whole bunch of them and tie a flame to them. We're going to burn up your kingdom, you lying devil. Hallelujah. Hear, O God, hear, O our God, for we are despised. Look, what does he do again? He prays. <laughs> now listen, that's your battle cry, Christian. We over here been trying to do some kind of relevant church methodology, smoke machines and product. I'm going to say it because it's ridiculous. Where has the church been? I keep saying that I didn't come up with it. I'm sure a much better man of God said it. But I was thinking, there used to be a time when preachers had calluses on their knees and tears in their eyes. And we over here with be better techniques, groovy plans, smoke machines, and, you know, whatever. Lord, help us. Yes. Whatever happened, good old-fashioned cry out to the king of glory. Whatever happened for your individual life, but also for the church. Hear, oh, our God, for we are despised. Here, oh my God, my boss doesn't like me. Here, oh my God, my husband's running around doing stuff he ain't supposed to do. Here, oh my God, what am I going to do? Here, oh my God, I messed up again. Here, oh my God, people hate me now because I'm talking about you. Turn back their talk on their own heads, oh Lord. And give them up to be plundered in a land where they are captives. Lord, if they're not going to yield their bow their knee to you and yield their life to you, then you seek vengeance on them. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Amen. He says, know this, he says, pray for those that despitefully use. Right. 
Pray for them and he will heap coals of fire yeah. upon their head. I don't think we're supposed to say, yeah, Lord, heap them coals. It's <laughs> <laughs> not supposed to be like that. Come on. We're, just, we're supposed to pray for them. Amen. And he will go to battle for us. Do, we believe, do you believe that? Yeah. Do you have the faith to believe that God is real? Amen. And that when you pray to him, he will change. Yes, Sometimes will. you'll see the change like that. Sometimes, you know, it'll be like a little seed in the ground and just wait until springtime. And when springtime comes and the sun warms up the soil yeah. a little bit, a little drizzle from the rain, right. poop, oh. what? <laughs> and then it's going to blossom. All right. Turn back their tongue on their own heads. But when Sanballat and Tobiah, the Arabs and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the repairing of the walls of Jerusalem was going forward and that the breaches were beginning to be closed, they were very angry. Okay, I'm getting tired. We're tired of your old plans, devil. You got, so you got angry again. Okay, big deal. No, really. I mean, what's the worst that he, what is the worst? And listen, he, ain't, he can't even just do what he wants to do. You can't just strike your body just because he wants to strike your body and kill. Oh, I'm scared, though. If I go out on the Lord, you're going to put something on me. No, you can't just do whatever he wants to do. But let's just pretend that something happened. And that, what's, the, what's the worst thing that happened? You die, and the next thing you know, you're on streets of gold and no more tears and no more sorrow? Come on, Christian. We need to get our head right in this. We're so Americanized. We're so worried about our material possessions. We're so worried about this little temporary life. Come on, man. No, this is a temporary life. Lord, help us. When they, there they are. They're angry again. I wanted to, I put these little graphics up there. Spears and trials. It doesn't really say that in the scripture, but this is where it happened. I was on the phone with Bill and Pat, and I said, look, man. We ain't even put diesel in the tractor good and the enemy is getting stirred up. And, and whether it's on the inside or the outside, we're going to be a harvest combine. What in the world? We can't even get out this speed bump. We better get together. You know what, you know what Pat, said? Pat said? Even in the harvest, there's warfare. And I was thinking, it made me think of the wall immediately. And that's how this turned into this message. And we ain't done yet. It made me think of the wall, and it made, and I, I imagined them with a trowel in one hand and a spear in the other, and they're working, and they're ready to do spiritual battle. What does that mean? That means that you and I might have to find different ways that we can still accomplish what God's calling us to accomplish. You still probably got to go to work tomorrow. Guess what? I got to go to work at 2 p.m. and work till midnight. I got to get up and go to work again at 2 p.m. tomorrow. Hallelujah. Sooner or later, that's going to be different too. But in the meantime, I'm still going to show up over here again tonight at 12, and I'm going to call on God, and I'm going to ask Him to move. Not just for me, but for you. And for the other people that are out there that are hurting and that are dying. I'm going to figure out some kind of way to still hold on to the Lord. And I know some of you are single moms and you got to, I get it. Maybe you can't make it to the church all the time. Find at least 15 minutes to fall to your knees and to cry out to God. They cry for souls. And they cry that the Spirit of God will move. Yeah. And then he'll start healing people. And then he'll start delivering people yeah. from the miseries and the things that they're in the midst of. Amen. Come on. Amen. Come on, church. Amen. Help me here. From that day on, half of my servants worked on construction and half held the spears. Shields, bows, coats of mail. And the leaders stood behind the whole house of Judah. This is the part, if you read the whole part in here, this is when they were locked in arms. He starts talking about, I had, I had some of the tribe of Judah right here. They were repairing the water gate. And I'm just throwing from the hip. I had, I had some of the perfumers right here. I had the goldsmiths over there. And look, I had some of the daughters of, and I'm making the name up because I can't remember, Shechaniah. I had his daughters over there. And they were all working together. And they had a trial in one hand and a spear in the other hand. And we're like, no, we getting on the wall, buddy. You lying devil, you're not getting us up off of this wall. We know what the Lord wants to do. He wants to rebuild the wall. He wants to bring back the protection. He wants the temple to be filled with the presence of God because he wants people's lives to be changed. He wants a witness in the land. Is this real, Christian? Yes. Is God real? Yes. Are people going to die if they don't know Jesus and go to hell? Are people going to get saved and live in eternity and be grateful? 
that you, you Pamela, you Robert, you Miss Angela, you Vince, that you, that you had a part, <laughs> a part, and that they, they didn't have to spend billions of years, plus another billion years, in turmoil, in torment. Because we just did what the Lord asked us to do. Not for our own glory. For the glory of Jesus. That the king would be magnified. Hallelujah. Now when Sambalot and Tobiah and Gisham the Arab and the rest of our enemies heard that I had built the wall. And that there was no breach left in it. Although up to that time I had not set the doors and the gates. Sambalot and Gishon sent to me saying, come and let us meet together. Oh, Lord, here we go. Oh, now we're going to do a deal. You was angry. You were grieved. You was making fun of me. Oh, now you want to do a deal. So guess what he's going to do? He's going to bring something your way, my friend. Can you get your heart ready? I already got them, them jokers over there at the hospital throwing all kind of money at me now. I'm just telling you, will you work this shift? We'll give you an extra thousand dollars. You should have been paying me right. Now. I'm saying it. You should have been paying people right to begin with. And I, she said, and I, and I offered, because I'm still there full time. I said, yeah, I'll help you out. And then and the doctor said, thank you for helping. I said, like, I'll help you while I'm here. I, I, I'll help you while I'm here. And she's kind of smiled. Can I get you to extend it? No, <laughs> I'm not extending it. But I know for a fact that on the next day after, they're going to still be throwing all this money at it. Guess what? No! Because it's got to be bigger than money. Right. And I listen to me. Pray for me. Hallelujah. Pray for me and I'll be able to hear the voice of the Lord. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. And that His will will be done. It ain't about money, my friend. Oh, it, you, you get the point. You know that. <laughs> Sent to me saying, come and let us meet together at Hakafirim in the plain of Ono. <laughs> I remember old Pastor Brad preached one of this one time and he said, oh no, I ain't going to own it. <laughs> but they intended to do me harm. See, that's discernment. Yeah. The Lord wants to give you the gift of discerning of spirits. Yes, yes. He also wants to give you wisdom through the word. Then you'd be able to discern what's going on. Because look, sometimes not even money. Sometimes some of you young people, he'll bring somebody into your life. <laughs> oh, you clipping along, living for the Lord, and then all of a sudden, oh, this must be the Lord. Mm. Maybe it is. Do you have to rush in? Can, can you wait on the Lord? Can you seek his counsel? A new job. Yeah. Maybe it's the Lord. But will we slow down? Will we seek the counsel? Will we be still and know that he is God? Will we listen for his voice? Oh, I've been praying about that. Okay, but did you pray about it this time? Because if you've been praying about it, that means the devil probably heard you pray too. Yeah. Sometimes the lie comes, Saul comes before David. Yes. It was a king, Lord, let us make like everybody else. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm just trying to give you wisdom from the word. The prophetic wisdom of the word. That's right. The word is prophetic all in of itself. My friend, it'll speak to you. It'll give you life. Nehemiah 6, 3. And I sent messengers to them saying, I am doing a great work and I cannot come down. <laughs> Why should the work stop while they're leaving and come down to you? Isn't that good? That's good. Uh-oh, here we go. This is getting to the end. Nehemiah 13, 1 through 9. This is what I wanted you to see right here. Because look, this is tying it all up. And it's bringing it to the place where the soul... I'll be able to find Nehemiah. Where the soul, okay, is trying to be invaded upon by the enemy where we've walked out from under the authority of God, where destruction has entered in, where we and now the Lord's building back up, right? Y'all know what I'm talking about. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. The Lord's building back up. You're seeing it moving your life, little by little, little by little. But if you keep yielding to him, I'm telling you, he's going to do a miracle in your life. Amen. It may not happen exactly when you want it to, but if you hold on to him, he will come through. He's going to do it because he wants to do it. Okay, but then the enemy, he's, he, he's starting to see it. He's starting to see God wanting to move in this church. He's trying to bring spirits of heaviness. But listen, he's trying, he, he wants to jump on some of you. And he wants you 
to bring some of that, whatever that is, mm -hmm. up in here. Mm -hmm. Because he wants to frustrate mm -hmm. all of this. So first he's coming from the outside, but what we're about to see right now, he's going to tricky trick. Mm -hmm. He's going to try to find a way to get in the house. Mm -hmm. on the, and look, look at this, the word of God, dude. Oh my gosh, so beautiful. I cannot tell you how important it is for you to put the word of God in your life. How will we know him? How will we even know the living word? Like <laughs> Solomon. How will we even know the living word if we ain't got the written word? Yeah. Like, dude, I need the written word so I can look back up at that to make sure that that's telling me the truth. Right? Every single time you see a resurgence in the word of God, especially in the Old Testament, Josiah, and now here, you know what? It's almost like they have lost the book of the law. How you lost the book of the law? How you lost your Bible? Yeah, yeah. People used to clown me back in the gap. Matt, your Bible's been here for four months. <laughs> Call up, oh, I've been in Venezuela for 30, 30 days. I said, Pastor Tommy's worried about you because you left your sword <laughs> at the church. <laughs> anyway, they found the book of the law and they're going to read it. On that day, they read in the book of Moses and the audience of the people and therein was found written that the Ammonite and the Moabite should not come into the congregation of God forever. Now I'm about to let you know a little hint. What was Tobiah? He was an Ammonite. We're about to find some revelation right here. Because they met not with the children of Israel with bread and water, but hired Balaam against them that he should curse them. Howbeit our God turned the curse into a blessing. Now it came to pass when they had heard the law that they separated from Israel all the mixed multitude. Listen, they were intermarrying with people they weren't supposed to marry during all this time. And then they started to realize, man, we're not even supposed to be hanging out with you people. Y'all part of the problem. Y'all growing us into the world. And before this, Eliashib, the priest, Having the oversight of the chamber. You remember them chambers? You remember them rooms I showed you? Having the oversight of the chamber of the house of our God was allied unto Tobiah. Let's see what the ESV says because I'm pretty sure that's going to say it was, he was related to Tobiah. All right? He prepared for Tobiah a large chamber, a room. Where they had previously put the grain offering, the frankincense, the vessels, and the tithes of grain, wine, and oil, which were given by commandment to the Levites, singers, and gatekeepers, and the contributions for the priests. While this was taking place, I was not in Jerusalem. So Nehemiah had to go back for a period of time, and somehow all that other stuff, Tobiah and Sambalot were trying. There's a spot in like chapter 6 where it teaches you that Sambalot actually married Eliashem, the priest's daughter. Wow. See, so when it doesn't work because I'm mad at you, when it doesn't work because I make fun of you, when it doesn't work when I want to go to deal with you, whenever the good men fell asleep, the enemy came and sowed tears. Whenever the people of God fall asleep, and when Nehemiah is out of town, the next thing you know, they come in through the back door, and they get tricky, and they say, I'm going to connect myself to the people of God, and I'll get myself up in there that way. Oh, he ain't quitting, my friend. He's trying to find a way. And while he was not in Jerusalem, for in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I went to the king. And after some time, I asked leave of the king. And I came to Jerusalem, and I then discovered the evil that Eliashib had done for Tobiah, preparing him a chamber in the courts of the house of God. This is exactly like your individual life giving place to the devil, Ephesians 4.27. You open up a door, and you allow the enemy to come in. To the house of God. And if you allow the enemy to come into the house of God, you might have brought him up in here. I'm not trying to blame you for anything. I'm just trying to make a point. Preparing him a chamber in the courts of the house of God. And I was very angry. Uh oh, now they got Nehemiah, man. And I was thinking this. This is like an angry wife. Look. This is like a wife that found out her husband cheated on her right here. Look at this. And I was very angry. I threw all the household furniture of Tobiah out of the chamber. He was on the lawn when he came home. 
Then I gave orders and they cleansed the chambers and I brought back there the vessels of the house of God with the grain offering and to put back in the house of God the stuff that's supposed to belong in the house of God. Told the stuff that wasn't supposed to be in the house of God. Get out in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. That's right. Hallelujah. So listen, I'm going to I'm going to close right now. Singers, musicians, you can come back. Get ready. And listen, don't pay attention to them. I'm closing. i got a couple of things I want to tell you real quick. This is my little punch line. They're going to work on the song. They're going to figure out. They're going to lead us in the song. Amen. But I wanted to tell you, whenever I said those names, I was trying to make a point because sometimes something simple like that can cause the enemy. And it may not have done that to you, but that, just whatever it is, the enemy wants to bring jealousy. And envy into our hearts. Sometimes it's not lust. Sometimes it's not drugs. Sometimes it's not alcohol. Sometimes it's not fornication. I'm going to use myself as an example. Because the Lord it showed me. That the reason all this happened. Was partially. So that I could reveal to you. The dangers that await us. If we're not careful. Alright. I've already told Brother Kirk this. And I've told a couple other people this. I'm going to say it. Whenever Brother Kirk preached that message. When he preached that message. You may think less of me after this, but it's okay I'm to the point where I don't really, I never was popular. <laughs> I just know that God will work with a humble heart. So I'm just trying to stay home. When, I, when Brother Kirk preached and he said, whatever, he said, when you need something done to you, call, are you going to call a mechanic or a spark plug to you? <laughs> Dude, yeah. something hit me. And then something, and I didn't even realize. And then some other stuff happened. No, 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 let me, let me tell you. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to say it. We were in Waffle House. Danielle and I in there, and some dude was drunk in the bathroom and came out, literally, dude, this happened. Some dude was drunk in the bathroom, came out, passed up Kirk, looked at me, turned around to Kirk, said, You a pastor? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Stand up! And he, dude, he grabbed brother Kurt's hands and he started to like prophesy something over his life and then he let go of his hands and he went and he sat at the bar he said I don't know why I just did that <laughs> and so Kurt is tripping because I mean kind of tripping. he's a man of God but I said dude that ain't never happened to you before and I'm over here thinking why it ain't no I was the pastor <laughs> maybe you're not the pastor the pastor sit down but, but anyway so he grabs all so, so then Kurt's like, <laughs> he said, that man's called me an evangelist. So he gets up and he goes over and prays for him. And since then, Kurt's called him more than once. I ran into him at Rouse's. I don't even know Rouse's. And I'm like, where y'all, dude? Come on. All right, but anyway, I go home that night. And dude, I'm getting good. It's spark <laughs> oh, and no, no, we're laughing, but it was ugly. <laughs> no, 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 let's get serious for a second, guys. This thing was like a snake, a serpent. Dude, I was getting all twisted up in my head. And all of a sudden, hallelujah. I'm like, that lion devil? You a lion devil. I got up out of my bed and I went up in this room. One day it's going to be my little prayer room in the house because I can't always go into the church. I have this fire to go pray. Right now in the middle of all that stuff because I'm about to do my bathroom. I got down and I said, oh, Lord, is it you? This is something that is not good right here, Lord, in the name of Jesus. And you know what? When that thing released, I can hear the voice. Yeah. You need to see. Because you need to understand what the enemy's going to try to do to your people. Yes. If it happens to you, and I let it happen for a purpose, that was all set up by the Lord, my friend. And when I told Kirk, he's like, brother, I would never, I said, you ain't going to explain yourself. I believe that the ear of the prophet hears the voice of God, that the mouth of the prophet speaks the perfect thing. Right there. Just what Matt needed to hear. Just what Matt needed to hear to get that stuff stirred up, to get him on his knees, to get him on his face. And you know what I said? told Kurt that day. I said, so Brother Kurt, because you see, and I think maybe, I'm trying to be humble. I'm at least a mechanic as a teacher. And I'm hoping that one day I'll be a master mechanic. <laughs> Prophetically, 
I'm a sport toy tinker. When I told Kirk, I'm like, brother, I'm going to be the best spark plug changer you ever saw. Hallelujah. Because I can graduate it. Yeah. And you know the good news is it ain't ever supposed to be a one-man show. That's what happened whenever Lily put that thing together. Ain't a whole lot of churches going to get behind that. They always want to know who's your covering, who's the church. But you know what? The people of God are ready to worship the Lord. The people of God are ready to pray for other people of God. People of God are ready to get out there and get it done. Because the past has been under a control spirit. I don't want to be that guy. God said, move out of the way and let my people get healed and let my people work for me. Listen to me. I know that the Lord spoke this morning. I just want to invite you to the altars if you want to come get along with the Lord. I want us to worship the King because He alone is worthy. Let's worship Him. Amen. Hallelujah.